All right, I've got uh, 10.02 uh, on January 24th. Uh, we're going to get the meeting started. Uh, I see that a quorum is present. Uh, Ashley, can you please take attendance? Chair Josh McKee. Present. Keith Brannon. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item number three, discuss and consider approval of the October 4th, 2018 board meeting minutes. Uh, chair entertains a motion to suspend the reading of the minutes. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. It has been made and seconded uh, to suspend the reading of the minutes. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The minutes will not be read. The minutes are approved as circulated. Moving on to agenda item number four. Uh, we're going to receive an update on plans for addressing uh, funding shortfalls. We're going to hear from the city of Fort Worth and the city of Galveston today. Uh, I would like to go ahead and call the city of Fort Worth's representatives up to the table to present their testimony. Keep the little button on the microphone, it goes green, green means go. Thank you, good morning everybody. That does pick up very well. Hey, greetings from Fort Worth. It's been a while since uh, I think we've been before you. I think the last time Burial Committee. I'm David Cook, City Manager of Fort Worth. I'm joined by Assistant City Manager Susan Alanis. We have other folks from Fort Worth in the audience. Uh, but what I thought I'd share with you is where we are in solving the pension problem we have in the city of Fort Worth. I think you have some presentation slides before you. I'll start with <clears throat> that the city council took action back in December, which put into motion the recommendations that we're going to share with you. Uh, we are having an employee vote on those contribution increases that I'll cover on the employee side. That will take place over a three-week period in February. And our plan was once, and we're going to count on a successful employee vote, I'll talk more about that. Um, uh, once we have a, a successful employee vote, we'll package that all together in the soundness restoration plan and hopefully have a nice bow around it and we'll have successfully moved forward on the solutions. You'll see from the council action that I'll go through in detail in a minute, it, it does a number of things. It increases the employer contribution. It increases the employee contribution, and then it also makes changes to uh, benefits and eligibility of the pension plan. If you look at that uh, slide number two, where it's actually the graphic that shows the lines going to zero, and we've used that slide over the last couple of years to describe that doing nothing wasn't an option and that we really truly have to solve the pension situation that we have in Fort Worth. And we can debate the year it will run out of money, but it will run out of money if we don't make changes. So we identified the scope of the problem. And we also, um, I think, and with feedback from this group right here, we developed a context for the solution that includes a 30-year closed amortization. We used a discount rate uh, lower than what the employee retirement fund was using at the time, and that's currently under debate again. So we used a seven and a half discount rate, 30-year closed amortization. The fund's still at seven and three quarters, but they're talking about reducing that discount rate as well as we move forward. Uh, turning to slide number three, we go into the, the contributions and how they're going to uh, change. Um, and again, one requires an employee vote. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but it includes a 4.5% of payroll contribution from the city of Fort Worth. The, so the city of Fort Worth will 
move their contributions right now. It's 19.74 for general employees and firefighters. That will move from 19.74 to 24.24, four and a half percent increase. And you'll see the police will go from 20.46 to 24.96. So the city is putting in again, four and a half percent of payroll. The employee contributions will uh, vary depending if you're a general employee uh, and fire and police. And another distinction that we make in our organization is we have already made changes to the benefit and they occurred or the impact was different effective dates whether you were a general employee, a firefighter or a police officer. Um, the effective date was different for each of those employee groups and so we refer to uh, group numbers or blue and orange service depending at which category you're in. So the blue service was before the benefit changes occurred, orange service was after. So if you see that language in there, it's trying to distinguish when those benefit changes were made. So the contribution increases will be different depending which group you're in and depending on whether you had the blue service or the orange service. <clears throat> the increases are higher for police, so they will be phased in over a three-year period. And for fire, they'll be phased in over a two-year period. And for general employees, over one, uh, one year. I think uh, we have a unique law in the city of Fort Worth in that an employee vote requires half of all the employees plus one. Not who votes, but of the total workforce, it has to be half of the workforce plus one voting in favor. So if somebody doesn't vote, it's the same as a no vote. So we're spending, really from the, we started a couple weeks ago, we're spending the entire month of January and February in sessions with employees explaining the changes and explaining how important it is for them to vote. Um, and again, what they are voting on are the changes that the employee contributions, not the other changes in the plan. If you look at slide four, the solution also has a risk sharing mechanism uh, to say that we're going to phase these things in over time. And there's a chance that if you don't meet the discount rate, if we don't have the investment returns, what is going to happen again? Um, so that again, we don't have to put a pension task force committee together and, and solve the problem all over again. So the risk sharing mechanism goes something like this. If we don't hit those numbers in a couple of years, then the city contributions will increase um, and employee contributions will increase no more than 2% a year, no more than 4% cumulative, cumulatively. And the uh, increases will be shared on a 60-40 basis, 60% 60 from the city and then 40% from the employees. So that could occur over a period of time. Slide uh, five shows what would happen in that risk sharing mechanism. And right now we, we know that the uh, fund returns for 2018 didn't hit the expected mark. Uh, so we... With, you know, without any changes, we know that the risk sharing will probably um, go into play. And so we're just showing again and sharing with employees what those additional contribution increases will look like in 2022 and 2023. The uh, slide number six gets into some of the uh, changes on the COLA. This was the controversial aspect of uh, the debate for, uh, I guess we're going on three years. Uh, and so the solution that was voted on by the city council essentially maintained the COLA for retirees, but it required then changes to COLA for other groups of employees. New employees don't have a COLA, so it's not an issue with orange service or new employees but employees that have been with the city for a long period of time. We described that if you don't retire before a certain date, and we give a date about two years out, if you don't retire or enter drop, then you 
are going to be moved to a variable COLA, which essentially says we'll pay the COLA if the fund outperforms the numbers. We're also sharing with people that it's not probable, it's not likely that the fund will outperform in those numbers, so they shouldn't think that they'll be getting a COLA in all likelihood, right? So even though it's a variable COLA and that sounds like it's possible, it is possible, but it's not probable. So we're just trying to share that with folks along the way. And then there'll be no COLA earned going forward for uh, future service as of an effective date of July 2019. Um, slide seven tries to describe the variable COLA, and again, we're just trying to, you're seeing some of the same slides that we're using with employees. And so you'll see that last bullet on there is, is simply trying to share that the COLA is not likely. Uh, again, the variable COLA is also described on slide eight, right? And again, I think you're aware of uh, what fund performance would have to look like to be able to trigger the COLA. We have to make the contributions that are required, and then we'll have to also prove that the fund moving forward could pay that COLA over the life of the fund. Slide nine describes uh, that we're also uh, requiring uh, contributions to the pension for overtime that currently wasn't in place. And, and so that'll go into effect. And that's, again, one of those aspects of contributions that employees are voting on. So not only the amount of the increase, but also uh, that it will be applied to overtime as well. Slide 10 speaks to the changes to sick and major medical leave. Uh, that was being uh, used for service credit, although no money followed it. So essentially, we're saying as of a certain effective date, that will no longer uh, be true. Slide 11, <clears throat> again, graphically is, is trying to uh, illustrate how we see the future and see where we are. The blue line is the objective. That's the 30-year closed amortization. Uh, that's the 7.5 discount rate. Uh, the red line uh, is the solution that I just uh, talked through, the contribution changes, the benefit changes, and the risk sharing. So it's the risk sharing mechanism that you see that puts us back on track to the blue line. The other lines, both the gray and the yellow, are simply to show that if you have lower discount rates, uh, we're going to be still above that line, but the trajectory after the risk sharing mechanism takes us uh, back down uh, in the right direction. Uh, slide 12 uh, speaks to the schedule that we're currently on. We're doing employee and retiree meetings. We have the employee vote, which will be conducted by the fund that will take place from February 4th to February 22nd. Uh, we'll have a joint meeting with the city council and the employee retirement fund board uh, in March. And we'll assume that at that time, we'll be talking about implementing the successful employee vote and uh, moving forward. <laughs> Slide 13 uh, describes those different groups. We break it down as we're communicating with employees because the message actually is a little different in how we carry it to new employees as opposed to long tenured employees. It's different in how you, we would explain it with retirees. And so the breakdown there is to just give you an idea of, of what the um, employee makeup looks like with the city of Fort Worth, and you'll get a sense then and how we might have to communicate that along the way. I, I did that in um, very, that's a, as you know, it's a very complicated issue. We've been working on it for over three years. Uh, we have a solution on the table. I did that quite fast. We'd be glad to answer any questions you have. <clears throat> Thank you, members. Questions for Fort Worth? I have a question. Um, who manages the plan's assets? Who's responsible for managing the plan's assets? The uh, uh, retirement fund, the employee retirement fund board. Yeah. I, I noticed later on in Kenny's actuarial report that the 10-year returns are very poor compared to even averages among Texas. I mean, with having to increase contributions so significantly, what attention is being paid to 
um, addressing the history of poor performance in the investments? Um, again, we get, we're, that's a great question because we get that a lot in our employee groups, right. right? And so part of that, I don't want to right turn and just make it the employee retirement fund, but the board and their staff are the ones that manage those assets, and it is getting a lot of attention and a lot of conversation in Fort Worth. So uh, I, I really like the, the action that you all have taken, and you're to be commended for the more money has to be going into the fund. Um, so this is, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I also very much like that you use 30-year close as the target so you don't have a moving target that you're aiming at uh, and very much like that you laid out ex-ante plans for what happens if you don't hit what you're aiming at. Uh, so laying out explicitly actions that will be taken if you have negative experience is a very positive thing. You called it risk sharing. Uh, I think that just keeps you from uh, having to go back and ask for more later on and um, like a dog chasing its tail, always trying to figure sure. out exactly where you are. So that's very, very good. Um, I look at uh, the investment performance uh, and I look at the chart on, on slide 11 for what will happen with the amortization schedule uh, and uh, I, I think that you know, five years out, we're going to have to have another conversation about more being done. Um, I, I think that's just very, very likely. Um, so it'd be great uh, if if you guys could prepare yourselves for this. This is um, a step, but it's not the entire fix. It's very likely that in five years you're going to experience a, a seven percent or so return over the the previous five years, and you're going to be at. Uh, a worse funded position and at a higher amortization period uh, than you want to be at. And it's going to take more money and, and some more sacrifice, shared sacrifice to get this plan back on firm financial footing. Um, I also agree with Marsha that, um, that the investment management is troubling. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more scrutiny uh, of what's going on on the asset side. Uh, even looking at capital market uh, assumptions over the next 10 years uh, from J.P. Morgan around a, uh, or uh, BNY Mellon, some of the big banks around a balanced portfolio, the 50th percentile uh, is below seven uh, for the next 10 years. Um, and, and if you're underperforming that balanced portfolio, that means you're <coughs> mid six or below. Uh, and so um, that type of performance is going to make it very hard for you to catch up. Um, so I think additional scrutiny needs to be um, applied to the asset side of the house as well. Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Can you clarify the approval process? What needs to happen for this to go forward? So the city council already took action on the eligibility and the benefit changes and the city's contribution. The only thing that remains is a vote of the employees to increase their contributions for the solution. And again, we have that unique situation that it requires half of our entire workforce plus one to vote in favor of it, right? So we have 68, roughly 6,800 employees. We need 3,401 to vote in favor, right? So it's a, how do you get 6,800 employees to vote? And have we communicated effectively enough so they understand the context, the circumstances, and vote in favor of the solution, which is their contribution increases? Thank you. And so they're voting only on the contribution change? Yes. Not on the benefits change? Correct. Uh, and there's no division in the vote between uh, um, sworn officers and uh, general employees. It's all combined. Uh, and one other question, please. What is the basis of that requirement that you get 50% uh, of all employees? Is that in state law? Is that a Fort Worth statute or what? That is a law. It's a state law that was changed, I want to say, in the 2005-2007 period 
that impose that requirement. And it's unique to Fort Worth? As far as I know. Have you ever had a vote uh, uh, using that uh, no. criterion? No. Thank you. So we'll know, we will know uh, by the end of February. Correct. And uh, if it's, if it's, uh, if you don't get 3,401 votes, then uh, this is off? I think what will happen, at, uh, we've, we've done the what if scenario, right? So let's say we don't have a successful vote, right? Then we'll get together. Which of the ones are we going to go ahead and implement anyway? The contribution on the city side, if so, how much? The benefit changes because they've already been approved, right? So it's are we going to have those uh, effective dates triggered? Because we'll still need to make more changes. And what we've talked about is if the vote doesn't isn't successful, then one of the options is to come down to Austin and say, shouldn't we change that state law that's unique to Fort Worth that requires us to have fifty? plus one percent of all employees, and maybe it should be just based on the number that vote, right? Uh, so that is what we've talked about, coming to get state law changes to help us do the solutions that we think we need to do in Fort Worth. So the benefits changes are codified. They're, they're approved. They're in code. Yeah. And we've established the effective dates, I think, that you see on the slides there, too. Okay, so if this yeah. doesn't pass, then it's just a matter of how it's going to get paid for. Yes. That, that I think it's been the challenge the whole all the way along. It's what changes you make and who's going to pay for it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Um, what uh, education activities? I saw a little bit in here. Um, can you just kind of walk us at a high level through exactly what? you're going to do to educate members and, and turn out that vote and how that splits between city and fund? Uh, sure. We're taking that on as a city responsibility on the education and communication. And so I want to say we've got, and, and we're about a week and a half into it already. So we've done probably two dozen uh, education meetings all at different times of the day because you meet crews out in the morning or when they come in at the end of the day. Um, uh, so we've done a couple dozen of those. We've got 40-some scheduled over that three-week period. Uh, we're doing them at night on the weekends. Uh, and again, it's a lot of what some of the slides you see here. We're trying to communicate what it means uh, for the organization. And what we really describe is that we want this plan to be successful, not just for the folks that have already retired, but for the current employees, as well as the employees we haven't even hired yet. Ones, the ones that we're going to hire this year, next year, and five years from now. And so we have to think about it. How do we do that and make it sustainable for all of us, right? So it's more of a collective description of how we want the fund to be successful over a long period of time. Frankly, what... Uh, when people come into those meetings, I think everybody's interested in how does this affect me, right? So we also have a way that they can communicate individually with our human resources department, right? To have very specific, their very specific questions answered, right? So we've got an email set up, a phone line set up to be able to do that. So we're trying to communicate and give people, the employees, an avenue to get very, their, their own specific questions answered. And again, and in, then encouraging everybody to vote. Uh, Marcia? Um, so to clarify, the benefit changes are going into effect irregardless of the outcome of the vote. So really the choice for the employee is either raise their contributions or face additional benefit changes down the road. Or that we would need to get the law change in order to be able to do those things, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. So in the slide talking about the, the risk sharing uh, portion of this, uh, I noticed um, there were some parameters around how the actuarially determined contribution would be calculated uh, for the uh, risk sharing measures to kick in or not kick in. Um, in that, there was a bullet that said discount rate consistent with the average reported by two independent sources agreed to by the city and the board. Um, can you just walk us through exactly what that process looks like? 
uh, what independent means and they're just going to average the two? Is that? Well, I can tell you, I think what the conversation, we've never had to do that before, right? But we know that we were using a different discount rate than the retirement fund was using, right? So we didn't want to get into a, a battle of, you know, what discount rate to use. So we would simply agree on this that we could, you know, independently and then uh, get to and then average them, I think I is the way it. we So the thought. city gets uh, a report, the plan gets a report, and then you average it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And we've never had to do it, so I, I'm, as I'm talking with you about it, it, yeah, it seems like that's how it would happen. Great. Uh, any other questions for Fort Worth? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. This is a big step in the right direction. Please let the Pension Review Board uh, me, Anu, know personally if there's anything we can do to help as you move towards this uh, member election uh, or afterwards. Very good. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. All right, now we're going to hear from the City of Galveston and the Galveston Employees Retirement Plan. Oh, oh hold on just a second. Sorry, I didn't invite the Vice Chair of the Retirement Plan of Fort Worth to come up. Uh, if you guys could come up. I meant to do that in the last invitation. Thank you. You probably could have answered some of those questions that I was asking. I can try. I'll do my best. Uh, do you have any prepared remarks, or did you just want to answer I, questions? I, I don't. Uh, first, I, my apologies. There should have been four of us up here today, but a uh, flight got canceled this morning, so fortunately I drove in last night. I'm here. Uh, my name is Rick Van Houten. I'm the vice chair of the... Uh, fund. Uh, Benita Harper, the interim executive director, uh, Ryan Falls, our actuary, as well as uh, our CFO, had planned to be here. Uh, my apologies, but I, while staying in my fiduciary lane of my position on the board, I'll answer whatever I can. Excellent. Thank you for making the trip. It sounds like it uh, was a, a bit of a pain. Um, so uh, I have just two things that it would be great if you could carry back to the board. Um, I think that Marsha's point on, on investment performance uh, is a great one. Uh, and I, sitting on the board, being vice chair of the board, I think that the board needs to apply additional scrutiny of how those investments are being managed. Uh, uh, dig in a lot on, on where you're investing and, and how you're performing relative to benchmarks, but also look at the overall portfolio and, and risk. It's a little troubling. Uh, that the plan has consistently underperformed uh, benchmarks uh, over time, and that's going to make it hard to catch up. Uh, and we're not exactly heading into kind of smooth sailing time at the moment. So um, I, that's a that's a big worry uh, for me. The other is on the discount rate. Given past performance, given uh, kind of trends across the country, discount rates are coming down. Um, the discount rate for the plan has, of course, come down over time, but I would... Uh, again, uh, ask you to apply a lot of scrutiny to that discount rate. Uh, biggest plan in the country, CalPERS is using 7%. Uh, our own TRS brought it down to 725. Uh, the coin flip return on a balanced portfolio is, is seven or below. Um, so uh, just need to get to a place where we've got accurate projections for the amount of money that it's gonna take uh, to actually make sure benefits are secure. Um, Correct. And, and if I may uh, dive a little bit into those points. Uh, some of the actions we have taken, we are taking. Uh, our executive director, our former executive director, is now retired. Uh, we've moved in that process. We've moved our uh, legal counsel, Benita Harper, up into the interim executive position. Uh, during this process, we've hired a governance consultant we're, uh, to look at splitting the executive director CIO position to uh, go into more of a strict CIO that will dive much deeper into investment returns um, and uh, will be held much uh, more accountable for the returns. Uh, we've also really taken over the past year a deeper dive into uh, looking at fee structures, uh, really renegotiating fee structures, trying to reduce those as much as possible. And I think having a full-time CIO that uh, can manage more of the assets, more of the investments themselves, and depend less on the fee-driven consultants will help us 
in that area as well. As far as the uh, uh, assumed rate of return, uh, we are at seven three quarter right now. We uh, next month we should be talking with our getting some actuarial reports back and really making some decisions on uh, the trend is we are going to be going down. Where are we going down to? Typically in the past, we've dropped, tried to gradually drop down. So do we drop from seven and three quarter back down to seven and a half, or are we going to drop to seven and a quarter this year? Um, obviously there's, there's pros and cons to both sides, but we also, uh, as fiduciaries, need to uh, really pay attention to what our actuaries are, are telling us, and uh, they are in much agreement with what you just said. So, it's great to hear. I, I would encourage you uh, to not be constrained by uh, where you are today and, and trying to be completely gradual. I think the fact that you uh, have been able to work with the city uh, to increase contributions uh, uh, shows a willingness to hear what the true cost is. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, uh, uh, again, not be constrained by where you are now and wanting to be gradual. Go to where uh, you think that discount rate is. It's always easier to adjust back up than it is to, to adjust down. Um, and if you are continually adjusting down, that target for cost continually moves. And I think that is very complicated for uh, your members and for the city of Fort Worth to really handle and absorb. Sure. Chairman McGee. Yeah. Um, in, in looking at the return assumption, as I recall, this plan has a drop. And, and so cash flow is an important issue. And I, I did not go back to see your prior actuarial reports or anything like that. So I don't know to the extent that you're paying out benefits at the current time more than the money you're taking in from contributions and recognizing that the contribution increases will be somewhat graded in. Um, I would really encourage you to focus perhaps, especially if there's more money going out than coming in, um, to focus on a, a five to 10 year projection of what investment returns are going to be because um, you're, you're actually facing a decreasing could be facing a decreasing fund, and and the 30-year may not be as relevant as a, a 10-year uh, expected return. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Richards. You, you listed a couple of uh, very interesting and very positive ideas, you know, splitting the role of uh, the executive director and CIO looking at the fees. One of the things I wanted to find out is, have you guys looked into your actual asset allocations? Um, you know, stocks, bonds, real estate. Can you talk a little bit about uh, those? I, when I kind of first started this as a fiduciary, I needed to stay with Sorry, could you hit sorry, your button? Turn, yeah, to hit the button on the middle. Perfect, thank you. How's that? Okay. Um, my apologies once again. Uh, I wish that uh, the flight hadn't been canceled. The people that can talk about that, uh, that planned on being here this morning, are not here. Uh, but we would be more, as a fund, uh, as a representative fund, we'd be more than happy to set up any meeting, come down back down to Austin for uh, to meet with you individually or. Uh, if there's information we have that we can share, we're, we are here to uh, work with uh, the city of Fort Worth, with everybody here. Uh, we can make that information available, I'm sure. Has the plan done an asset liability study in the recent past? I know we have. Uh, I, I can't give you the exact time that that uh, was done. Uh, but I'm sure we can get you a copy of the, the latest one we have. Fantastic. So I, I would I would recommend that uh, the board follow up with the plan once we get past this employee vote uh, and and really get some information on the asset side, fees, uh, and uh, we're here to provide any help uh, and assistance that we can as you dig into that side of things. Sure. Any other questions for the plan? All right, thank you very much for making this. Thank show. you.
And that concludes our uh, business with uh, Fort Worth and the Fort Worth Employees Retirement Fund. Uh, I'd like to call the City of Galveston and Galveston Employees Retirement uh, Plan for Police up. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys all want to come up once, that's easier for me, or if you want to divide it. If you want to divide it, then I guess the city should come up first. We'll let the plan have the last word. We'll probably all come along. Trip, uh, could uh, we just kind of go uh, from left to right? Or right to left is fine. Uh, I'm Jeff Gainer. I'm oh, you're right. I know. I should have <laughs> uh, stayed right. I'm Jeff Gainer. I'm the chairman of the plan. Dan Buckley, deputy city manager for City of Galveston. I'm Mark Finlaw of Rudd and Wisdom, and we've been retained by the city to be a, an objective resource in helping them. Um, find a solution. Great. So uh, whomever would like to go first. Uh... Good morning. Uh, uh, you know, hear me okay? I'll try to tone it down. I have a loud voice to begin with and it's amplified. Sometimes it's even worse. Um, thank you for uh, having us here on uh, probably three, maybe four occasions. We've met with the actuarial committee, uh, giving them updates on what we're doing. It goes back to about 2016 when we submitted our uh, restoration plan to the Pension Review uh, Committee. Um, we've been working diligently since that time to uh, achieve um, you know, improvements to the plan. Uh, we've made some incremental steps along the way. Uh, initially, uh, the city increased its contribution rates uh, from 12 to 12.83 based on an actuarial study at the time. Uh, subsequently, we've increased it to 14.83. We went up two more percent. Um, and uh, the plan on, on their part had uh, in, modified their um, uh, their ability to vest in the plan. They were fully vesting at five years. They changed their vesting period to 50% at five years and a 10% incre increment each year thereafter to fully vest at 10 years. Uh, they also recently uh, increased their uh, retirement age for new hires. Uh, those that come on board after January of 19 uh, to 55, uh, which over time will make a marked improvement to the plan. Uh, it doesn't do much to move the ball now, uh, but over time it'll do a lot to uh, uh, improve the plan. Um, we, we've focused in on a couple different areas uh, that we're still negotiating, we're still talking about, we're still trying to, to bring closure to, and, and they get down in the, this, the biggest issue for the city's board governance. Uh, right now, the board is comprised of four uh, union members uh, and three appointed by the city. So the beneficiaries of the plan have a majority on the board um, and unfettered access to the basic tax dollar. Uh, they can make changes to the plan. Assuming the plan is healthy, they can make changes to the plan, which should directly impact the city on this bottom line and go directly to tax dollars. The city has a fundamental problem with that type of structure. Uh, the next area that we wanted uh, to focus in on, uh, dealing with the funding methodology. The state law now, the funding methodology that's in state law will never resolve the problems of the plan. Um, we've, we've talked about a fixed funding policy. We've talked about uh, the uh, ADCR. We've talked about a bifurcated uh, methodology. And we continue to have discussions on that. We, uh, the reason Mark's here is, is the city put together a proposal. And what we're trying to do is, is come up with a methodology, with the idea of a 30-year closed plan is what we want to do. And we want to get the plan healthy. Uh, by the city, the initial analysis was to increase the contribution rate on the city side by 17% and hold the employees where they're currently at at 12%. By doing that, it would bring the amortization, based on the last actuarial study, I don't think this is valid today, uh, it would bring the plan down to about 30 years. Uh, we, we sought an additional comfort or cushion by having the plan adjust the retirement age of existing employees down to 55 and you get about one year off of the amortization with each age year they increase the the, the uh, retirement age we haven't really brought we have not made closure on that that has been a, uh, a discussion point but uh, quite honestly the, the 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 trustees do not want to do that uh, so you know those discussions remain open 
Um, I, I guess if, if I could, let me let Mark discuss our plan for funding and so at least to bring you all up to speed. I think the actuarial committee has actually heard this, but you as a committee a whole have not. So if I could just defer to Mark and let him describe the, our funding methodology to you. Uh, the city asked us to do an actuarial audit first, and we reviewed uh, the valuation, the available valuation at that time, and pretty much agreed with the, their, the plans actuary. Um, but having that data uh, enabled us to do some studies, to do some um, different ideas for reestablishing an adequate contribution arrangement. And, and then there was a meeting, and um, the, the discussion was at first about a, a sort of a modified fixed rate plan, um, but the, the police really wanted a, an actuarially determined contribution rate arrangement. So the, the city, without asking me, said, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> uh, and so we worked on uh, coming up with a modified ADCR arrangement. And I, I told the city, uh, even though the police thought it was going to be a pure ADCR like TMRS cities have, the difference is that TMRS cities agree to pay the actuarially determined contribution rate, but they also have control over the benefit design. In Galveston, the city does not have control over the benefit design. The, the seven-member board by state law has four policemen on it, so the, the city doesn't have the, the ability to make tough decisions to tweak the benefits to reduce benefits. So we put in some constraints that would protect both the, the city's uh, maximum contribution rate and the police officer's contribution rate. It was sharing uh, adverse experience, um, but with maximums, and then a, a, a way to deal with very adverse experience that would put the responsibility on the board to come up with a, some combination of, of contribution increases and benefit reductions to reestablish an amortization period of 25 years. Uh, we agreed with them that layering of additional gains and losses was appropriate, um, but they, they didn't really like the constraints that were on the modified ADCR approach. So that's, um, I guess that's why we're sort of stuck. Um, to, to go on a little more, I think the, uh, the, the keys for us is if we can, if the, if the city is seeking uh, law cha changes in the state law that deal with the structure of the board. Uh, one of the, um, the the discussions we've been having is if we don't get that, could we get a uh, an agreement from the trustees to have a supermajority uh, for benefit changes uh, as an incremental step if we can't achieve a state law change? Uh, we've, we've talked about that. Uh, the city uh, also has a seven-member leadership with our council and mayor, the super majority is six to seven. Uh, I think what we've, uh, a simple majority just wouldn't do it in the city's opinion. I think it needs to be a super majority so the city's seeking a six or seven vote for benefit changes. So that is uh, the two options we have for governance. One being legislatively, if we can achieve that, then if we can seek some type of resolution through a super majority. Um, you know, the, uh, again, it's, th that is uh, the, probably the biggest issue in the city's mind just because of the unfettered access to the city's checkbook and the taxpayer's dollar. Uh, one of the other things I'm very concerned about as we move down this road of, of resolving the issues with the plan is, you know, the last numbers we have are before 2018, which wasn't a spectacular year from a return perspective. And I have a concern that the rate of return that the plan uh, actuary uses is uh, excessive in today's market. I've said that at least for since 2016. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's still 50 basis points or so high, uh, maybe more. Uh, I think a lot of very educated people will debate that point, and uh, everybody will feel very confident in their uh, number. But, uh, you know, I think 7% is a, a lot closer to the mark than 7 where half they're, where they're at currently. Uh, so, that, so that remains a concern to me. Um, we've uh, started, we started legislatively with our uh, representative Faircloth who lost the election. We have a new representative, uh, Mays Middleton, and uh, we are going to, he is new into office and our intention is to work with both he and Senator Taylor uh, to see if uh, they can work with us collectively with the, with the pension board to bring some legislative changes into the law. We're in favor of uh, general language in the law uh, that will, you know, mandate certain requirements, i.e., uh, an amortization period less than 30 years, possibly a closed uh, 
uh, period, um, the structure of the board, and then really leave the rest up to the trustees as long as we can get the, 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 the structure changed on, from a governance perspective. Because we think the, the people that know it the best would be the trustees and, and one of the requirements that uh, we've talked about and it was very similar to I think what they did in Dallas is they put an education, not an education, but experience and an education requirement in for trustees. Uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult for people to get their arms around pensions, um, you know, without some type of uh, finance background. And so we think an education or uh, um, background experience is, is principal to what we can do. And I think you can do that internal to the plan in their bylaws saying, you know, to, to serve, you must have this type of background or you must have this kind of experience or you're going to be trained. Uh, and I think all of those are, are good things. Uh, I think all volunteer boards, which uh, these are, um, need ongoing training. And that is, uh, is something that the city would like to see. So again, we continue to work. Um, you know, we've, uh, you know, we, 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 at that point you say we're at loggerheads. Uh, you know, we, sometimes we have to step back and cool off and, and say, okay, let's take another run at it. Um, we've got, um, you know, a lot, still a lot of work ahead of us. So that's a. Thank you. Sure. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Gainer, I'm chairman of the board. Um, I think before I, I get into the board side of these negotiations, I want to add a little context because I, I also have not had a chance to address the entire board, only the uh, actuarial board. Uh, this plan is established under 6243P um, individually. It was established in 1997, and the way the contribution structure is supposed to be set up is the uh, members uh, are contribute, uh, contribute at a fixed rate up to 10%, which we've exceeded as of 2007. Um, uh, and the city is supposed to contribute an actuarially determined contribution rate that is calculated by the interest on the unfunded liability, the municipality's normal cost, and the administrative cost of the plan. Um, in my research since the beginning in 1997, this actually determined contribution rate has never been met. Um, it has always been treated as a fixed contribution rate. Um, with that, to that end, for the past uh, the greater part of two decades, the plan hasn't received the amount of contributions that it was supposed to be receiving per the statute. Uh, over that time, the members have increased their contributions and decreased their benefits over the past 20 years. Uh, currently, the Galveston Police Plan has the uh, lowest normal cost of any public safety plan in the entire state of Texas. Uh, we have no COLA. We have a 2.11% multiplier. Uh, and that is it. We, have, uh, we base our uh, benefit on five years, on our last five years average base pay. We contribute 12% of all pay that we make. It, uh, and we contribute more than the normal cost of the plan. Um, when the city brings up extending our, uh, our retirement age, it's just a way of saying that they want to decrease the value of the benefit, which I've said since day one that I am wholeheartedly against. Um, we have made an, an incredible amount of cuts over the years thinking that we had to, and uh, you know, as in the last couple of years since I reevaluated and re, uh, redid the valuation of the plans and uh, more to align of what the statute says right now um, and realized how far off we were and that's what brought us into this situation right now. So in, in starting off those negotiations, I, I said to the city that if, if we're going to deny the plan these millions of dollars uh, that have not been contributed over the years. We're going to have to do something to offset the loss of that, uh, the monetary loss to the plan. For instance, we're going to need to solidify the plan using some of the best practices the PRB is recommending right now. That's the only way as a fiduciary I can justify not collecting this money from that was not paid in the past. That's where we developed the closed ADCR of 30 years layered amortization. We offered uh, a supermajority vote on benefits. Um, we, I told the city that, you know, I, I don't have any fiduciary obligation to people that are not here. If they want to raise the retirement age to 75 for people that have not been hired, it is their benefit to offer, but it is a defined benefit plan. 
And as long as we are being sound fiduciaries and, and, and doing our jobs appropriately as board members, then the city should be obligated to uphold what they promised to these members when they came in. Um, like I said, it's the lowest normal cost in the state. This is not a benefit problem. It's very much a contribution problem. Um, we, the city says that we have unfettered access to city funds. Well, if we did, then we wouldn't be here, obviously, because we would be getting the contributions that are in the statute currently, um, or we would get, or we would have not have the lowest benefit in the state of Texas for public uh, safety workers. Um, it's a little disingenuous to say that we have this unfettered access. I've offered in, in my proposal a two to one ratio of a closed ADCR. Um, I've offered the city three different scenarios of how to implement that. The first being that the city start off at a two to three ratio and the police stay at 12 and taper down by a quarter of a percent every year. That would establish about 15 years worth of overpayments. Uh, they would establish another, again, half of the time in that closed ADCR would be overpayments to account for any type of negative experience or any adjustments that would negatively impact the unfunded liability over the course of that 30-year closed plan. The second was starting the city at 17 and incrementally increasing them by a quarter of a percent while decreasing the uh, members by a quarter of a percent every year. Uh, that particular model under the current estimates kept the city under 18 percent and again at 15 years there still was an overpayment uh, I believe it was somewhere around 15% as opposed to the 18 or 20% that under the first one. And then the last one uh, was again an incremental decrease by the membership and the able to uh, then use the remaining overpayment to keep them um, at 17 for the longest period of time. So for instance, if they if we overpaid at a, uh, an amount that kept them the, the delta between 17% and whatever the ADCR was at the time, they were able to use all of that. And then as that delta decreased by the overpayment, then they would creep up. I think that it kept them at 15, or 12 years, and I don't have it in front of me, I think that that kept them around 17.23%, which is relatively close to their target at 17%. I presented those uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, they were not interested in it. I, I again told them how adamant that I was that we move into an ADCR, a closed ADCR. We use layer, layered amortization. We use all of the latest and greatest things that the PRV is, is, is promoting because that's the only way I can justify the, the plan not receiving the money that it's been shorted for 18 years. So with that, uh, I'm done. Thank you. It's safe to say uh, we don't yet have agreement between the city and the plan. Uh, looking at the numbers here, um, you know, at the 7.5% discount rate, and these are a little bit dated, I'm seeing uh, around a 5% of pay uh, uh, difference between uh, and the contributions that would actually be necessary to pay off the unfunded liability. Um, but I'm also seeing a plan that's less than 40% funded, uh, probably way less at this point. Uh, than 40% funded, um, you know it's it's surprising to me that uh, that. But I understand that sometimes history and context gets in the way of, of arriving at an agreement. Um, I, I want to understand kind of what happens next uh, for each of you. I. I Uh, we haven't been able to arrive uh, at a solution that closes that gap. Um, I understand that, that governance is a big sticking point for the city. Uh, I understand that uh, contribution rates uh, without uh, significant benefit changes is a sticking point for the plan. Um, can you guys uh, independently just kind of walk me through? I understand we're at, we're at, a, at a, a point where there's no agreement, but we're in legislative session. Governance changes require law change. You talked about law changes. Can you just walk me through exactly uh, kind of what you think is going to happen over the coming three, four, five month period uh, and where we'll end up? Um, I have no idea where, where we're going to go. I can tell you what uh, I would like to see, and that would be changes that are uh, 
similar to Houston, I've worked with um, the executive director on, on looking at the Houston plan, uh, which is very similar to what it was that I was, to what I was trying to uh, accomplish in my plan. The only difference being a corridor and some mechanisms that were reduced benefits. A lot of those having to do with freezing colas or reducing colas, um, which we don't have. Uh, the only thing that we could reduce is, is the benefit itself. Um, I, I very much agree that the city should have a greater vested interest in matters pertaining to this plan that affect the city. I don't think anybody would ever argue that. Anything that would cost them more, um, they should have uh, a, a more equitable decision-making uh, authority in that. However, on things that do not pertain to it, I would argue that the board in and of itself or the members of the plan have a greater vested interest in the strength and the viability of the plan than even the city, given the fact that it is their livelihood. Um, that, could, that matter could be debated back and forth, but the members in this particular plan have made very prudent decisions throughout the entirety of its life. We, are, we have been invested uh, very appropriately. We have always used investment managers. We have always used a balance um, uh, asset classes and, and you know we've, we've made the decisions that we've needed to over time. Um, the, the more negligent decisions that have really affected the plan have come outside of the board's abilities and they've been things that we've inherited from city decisions such as layoffs. Um, so would it be accurate to say that you're contemplating a legislative package that will look similar to Houston? Correct. Great. Um, so uh, I also, just in scanning, you said that uh, you have the lowest normal cost of uh, public safety plans. That appears to be accurate. I haven't looked at the discount rates, but uh, that appears to be accurate. Um, I'll just note that on the governance piece, um, whenever municipalities have not felt some ownership of that decision making, it's become problematic. Uh, this uh, is part of what happened in Dallas, uh, is the city paid their f fixed rate uh, that was in state law and didn't feel complete ownership of all the decision making and how it, and didn't understand how it was impacting them on, uh, on the city side and on the budgetary side. So I think that, you know, from your point of view, uh, I, I would welcome more city ownership uh, of the plan and securing the plan. Uh, essentially what you're asking for whenever you're asking for increased contributions. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important going forward. Um, I, uh, I want to apologize up front. I did not get into a lot of the history related to funding. Uh, I know that we've shared that with the actuarial committee uh, in Nausea. Uh I think that you've probably seen it in the reports from the uh, from Anu and, and her staff, so I, di I didn't get into that. But just as a, as a kicker, you know, it's the the city is uh, contributions rates were made based on a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, can, I, the, can I just quickly interrupt to sure. to summarize my memory from the actuarial committee? There's a state law and there's collective bargaining agreements. Both say two different things about what the contribution rate is going to be. Right. Uh, so there's this problematic. I don't think this is something. The contribution rate and the history on that is something we're going to be able to resolve. Because right. clearly both sides have agreed to things that have underfunded the plan over time, and we're dealing with that legacy right now. Um, I think the fact that, it, that some of those contribution rates were in collective bargaining, the fact that there was a state law and we're not following the state law is problematic, uh, but I'm more interested in, in kind of what happens next. And I absolutely agree, and that's why I didn't get into any of that history when we met with the uh, actuarial committee. We said, you know, that's all history. Uh, what we need to do is figure out to fix the plan going forward. But, you know, that was a big part of Jeff's presentation initially was what uh, their position is, and it's very contrary to the city's and our, and our legal counsel. So not about that. But moving forward, uh, I think what we want to do is I, I think our path forward is, is to meet collectively, talk about the issues we can agree on. I think if we can get some uh, legwork on governance, if we can reach some agreement on governance, I think the city is going to be very flexible uh, from a funding methodology going forward. Um, I think that if we can reach that agreement and we can get uh, support from Representative Middleton and Senator Taylor that uh, we'll have success in getting that resolved uh, legislatively. Um, in all our meetings with various uh, members of the, 
uh, legislature, it is important and imperative in their mind that both Middleton and Taylor support uh, whatever we agree to. And we've known all along, everyone that has met with us, and that comes from uh, the former or chairman of the um, House uh, Pension Reform Committee, uh, told us, y'all got to fix it. You know, you don't want us to fix it. You need to reach agreement, and uh, and we've heard that time and time and time again. So, you know, we, we heard that, and we, and we know that's something we have to do. But from the city's perspective, uh, number one priority is going to be governance. If we can reach some uh, resolution on governance, I think that we can go a long way. We're prepared to increase our contribution rates to 17%. Uh, understanding the city's budget, and uh, you can't do things mid-year uh, because that's not the way the budgeting process works. Um, I think that uh, we need a long-term viable funding methodology for the plan. I want to see the plan below 20 years. Uh, I don't think we ought to make any substantial changes to the plan until we get there. Um, you know, until you get the plan on a sound financial footing, I don't think you ought to make changes. And, and we're diametri diametrically opposite on that. I, I, I think we've got to get the plan healthy. I don't think we ought to reduce contribution rates until we get the plan healthy. When it's healthy, the city's already agreed up front that we move quickly to a two to one uh, contribution rate. Any we've, we've said we'll sustain 17 if the plan's performance improves, the city will sustain its 17% contribution rate until the, the rate for the officers declines to where we'd have a two to one uh, and the city wouldn't reduce theirs at all. So, you know, we're, uh, we're willing, we're able, um, and uh, we just want to keep working at it. Uh, but we, we recognize that this is the time to make the, the, the legislative uh, changes that, need, that are necessary. Great, thank you. Uh, so it sounds like you're pursuing a legislative package. You're still open to uh, having some sort of combined package between the city and the plan. Um, just one one quick comment uh, on, on this, and then I'll open up to other members. I'll stop dominating the time. Uh, the, so it, it sounds to me that while you're uh, at loggerheads, while there seems to be a, an impasse, um, that there's shared room for agreement here, that more money needs to get into the plan. There's disagreement over the particulars of governance, but I heard openness uh, to changes on the governance side. I think that more city ownership uh, and, and stake uh, in the management of the plan uh, would be a good thing. Um, I, I hope that, uh, that we can put some of the the animosity aside and arrive at a good solution. Uh, I agree with legislators when they say you don't want them to fix it. Uh, it's very complicated when you have dueling proposals and legislators pick and choose from those different proposals and then you have a horse race. Uh, that just gets very complicated and often ends in something that's pretty piecemeal uh, and doesn't actually get you where you need to be. Uh, I would caution that that type of approach will very likely lead to more contentious uh, debates after the session will solve very little. Um, and that's that's my concern is that you have some, a session where you get something uh, in law, but it doesn't really fix it and you end up having to fight and come right back in, in two years. Um, so I, I just provide that caution and I'll open it up to other members. I, I would put to the fund again the same perhaps comment that I made uh, earlier, which is your fund results over the 10-year period, while better than the one we looked at a few, an hour ago, um, is still pretty mediocre. And I would ask, what, what have you, what has the fund done to address kind of subpar performance on its investments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, don't think it's been quite two years ago, but we did uh, put out an RFP and, and changed investment managers. We went from and it's been a long time, I can't remember, but we, we transferred to a, uh, from a passive manager to an active manager that had a better history with um, market fluctu fluctuations and, and, and protected the bottom a little bit better, and we're in the middle of evaluating that, but it hasn't quite been a market cycle yet. Uh, but the investment committee just met, I think, uh, a week or two ago, and we have a, an upcoming board meeting that I think that the investment committee is going to um, share what their recommendations are as far as uh, their evaluation so far. Keith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have learned that pension reforms work only when all stakeholders are involved in the process, and when it's one-sided, it doesn't work. Um, so I would encourage you, as you're working with uh, Representative Middleton and other legislators, to please include the board and the plan participants. 
Otherwise, we'll be back here soon enough. Thank you. Other questions, comments from the board? Again, thank you for all your hard work on this. This is a really important uh, uh, problem. This is one of the, the worst funded pl plans in the, in the state, uh, and we are uh, very anxious to see positive uh, improvement in that funded ratio. Uh, as you work with the legislature, as you kind of move through that process, continue to negotiate, please let us know if there's anything that we can do uh, to be supportive or help. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, how this ends up. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to uh, agenda item number five, the actuarial committee. Uh, committee. Uh, we're going to discuss and consider uh, the items on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Brainerd, can you uh, take the mic, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These items are behind tab 3A of your book. And uh, I would ask uh, that we recognize uh, PRB actuary Kenny Herbold, please. Called to hear in some of the corners. There we go. And um, if I can uh, direct your attention to where we are with tab 3A, uh, we'll go ahead and start with uh, the summary of uh, key statistics from our actual evaluation reports. Uh, one of the things that uh, might be uh, glaringly obvious is the unfunded accrued liability increased from our prior effective dates to the current effective dates by uh, over $11 million. Um, but I wanted to I, um, basically point out that the primary reason for that is uh, TRS's reduction in assumed rate of return. So they lowered their assumed rate of return um, to seven, uh, from 8 to 7.25 that increased their accrued liability by $10.5 billion. Uh, so that's really the, uh, the primary uh, reason that we're seeing such a, a large increase in the unfunded and that drop in, in the funded ratio. So I will also direct your attention down to the bottom of that particular page, uh, the liability weighted mean and liability weighted median. Uh, really, um, these are somewhat more useful in a, uh, a different context in Texas. Uh, those really are driven significantly by TRS. So the, the median is almost ex is exclusively TRS because they're over 50% of our uh, uh, liability, 50% of the assets in the state. So and those, uh, those statistics are going to be driven by TRS almost exclusively. Uh, so if we go back to amortization periods, despite seeing a really large uh, increase in unfunded accrued and that drop in funded ratio, uh, you'll notice that uh, the increases in the uh, amortization periods actually uh, were kind of coming down. We're not actually going up. If we look at the periods above 40 years, or excuse me, above 30 years, uh, there's really only one additional plan that falls into that grouping. Uh, so, and, and there are some additional plans that have kind of shifted down to the bottom of the range. So we are, uh, despite you know what some statistics might indicate that, that we seem to be moving in the wrong direction, uh, we are. We do have some others that, that are a positive, uh, and that is despite the fact that some of these plans have also lowered their discount rate as well. So we're seeing um, the uh, assumed discount rates coming down. Uh, amortization periods are not uh, necessarily increasing as much as we might expect along with that for some of the smaller plans. Uh, so that's certainly a positive uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, uh, if you'll notice that uh, we don't have any plans that are over 8% at this point. Um, so most likely that uh, we're going to be shifting this particular table a little bit to kind of expand uh, what we see below 7% so we get a better idea. As, as uh, the plans come down, you know, we, we want a little bit more um, clarity on where they're actually going. Uh, so in future reports, we'll kind of expand those and, and that eight, over 8% will drop off since there's nobody there. If uh, on the next page is uh, a little bit more detail, I just you know don't have a, a whole lot to point out. I just wanted to identify a couple of um, uh, large changes. As I said, uh, TRS has um, lowered their discount rate that increased their um, amortization uh, to excuse me their effective amortization period to 87. Uh, we did have a couple of plans that have dropped uh, fairly drastically. Uh, Galveston Fire, as a matter of fact. Uh, whereas it infinite at the prior amortization period, they had a, 
Uh, I know they had some uh, some agreements, and under their new uh, agreements and plan changes, uh, they're now dropped down to the second page, and they are um, below 30 in the 27-year 20, uh, range. And I did want to um, uh, provide a little bit of context. So uh, our effective amortization period takes into account um, the actual contributions that are going into the plan. So if an actuarial valuation indicates that this is an amortization period, but it's based on, for example, Galveston Police, their current valuation is based on the statutory requirement, and those contributions aren't going into the plan, uh, we are calculating the amortization period based on what we expect to go into the plan. So if you look at uh, Galveston Police's amortization period of 35.5 on that first page, it's actually based on a fixed rate of 14.83%, which is what the city has currently agreed to in their collective bargaining. So this uh, change doesn't take into account any of the negotiations or any potential uh, impact. So that gives us a baseline uh, if they do have legislation and we have to discuss uh, you know, the impact that, that's going to give us a baseline for that. That is pretty much all of the uh, prepared remarks I have for the actual evaluation report, so I'm more than happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you. All right. Well, I thank you all very much. For thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if we could ask uh, PRB staff member Brian Burnham to come up and talk about uh, tab 3B. Good morning, uh, members. I'm Brian Burnham, the financial analyst for Pension Review Board. Uh, behind tab 3B, you'll find the uh, public retirement system compliance and reporting. Um, this is as of January 16, 2019. Uh, you'll notice that currently uh, we have 15 less non-compliant plans than we did back in our October board meeting. Um, total net assets have increased by over 10 billion. Uh, the major reason for that would definitely be TRS. We got their cat friend very recently, and they've obviously drive that number quite a bit. Um, there's one more plan currently with an amortization period over 40 years than we had at the last board meeting. Um, uh, that Those plans will definitely be covered further on in the FSRP report that uh, my colleague Reese will be giving shortly. Any questions about the summary? Okay. And moving on, you'll see the 60-day uh, non-compliant list. Um, as a reminder, uh, Northeast Medical used to be on this list, and they are now off of it as of October. They provided us their 2017 audit, and we were finally able to remove them from this list. Uh, Nagadochis uh, County Hospital District Retirement Plan, a little background on them. Uh, they recently left the Texas Hospital Association and they froze their defined benefit plan uh, back in September of 2018. Uh, they rolled their funds to Principal Financial Group, and they, um, they were assuming that the Texas Hospital Association 2017 filings for them, but that did not happen. Uh, they stated back in April uh, that they are working with Alliance Benefit Group to complete the AV for 2017 and that they would be working with Alliance Benefit Group to also do the other PRB reports or the three annual compliance reports, which are the financial audit, the PRB 1000 investment returns report, and their membership report. Um, our last communication with the plan was back in August. We've had difficulty getting a hold of them since our previous contact has left the plan, and we are diligently working to try and find someone else we can talk to about their compliance issues. A little background on San Benito. Um, they informed us that they needed to restate their plan audit as the information originally reported uh, to us was not correct. Um, they have given us a draft audit. We have not heard back from whether or not they are. Oh, actually, no, we have heard back that um, the draft audit contained errors and they are working with their auditor to get those corrected. Midland Fire is in a similar state. Um, they notified us back in July when the reports were originally due that their audit process was starting late due to circumstances outside of their control. Um, we just uh, contacted them and I talked with David Stacy this morning and he said that they've gotten a draft audit back from their auditor, 
but they are working with their auditor to get corrections on it because it was not presented to them in complete accuracy. Um, you'll also find uh, a few pages back after the, uh, the total assets reports a sample of the 60-day compliance non-compliance letter that we sent to the city of Irving and behind that is um, their compliance letter that was sent after the reports came in. Are there any questions with the 60-day non-compliant report? Okay, and with that, the last page has a table with a breakdown of the total net assets for all of our plans. As I stated with the summary, it is we have increased them by 10 billion since the last board meeting. And if there are no questions, then that will conclude my report on the compliance of their systems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on to item 3C, Mr. Freeman. Can you give us an update on the FSRP, please? Good morning, members. I'm Reese Freeman, financial analyst for the Pension and Review Board. Behind tab 3C, you'll find the funding soundness restoration plan report. While we have not received any new or revised FSRPs since the last board meeting in October, in the first table you can see that two plans missed their FSRP due date since that board meeting, University Park Fire and Harlingen Fire. In November, we received correspondence from Harlingen Fire and the city of Harlingen regarding the fund's inability to reach an agreement on potential changes to their retirement plan. Earlier this week, Harlingen Fire's chairman provided an update on their progress towards developing a revised FSRP. This update included a summary of two proposals, one from the plan and one from the city of Harlingen. The plan has proposed the addition of a new benefit tier for new hires, as well as possible contribution increase for active members who remain in the current benefit arrangement. The city's proposal would increase city contributions and a monthly supplemental benefit and would move new hires into a new retirement system. Both of these proposals were sent to Harlingen Fire's actuary for review, and the plan hopes to approve one of these two proposals at their board meeting next month. University Park Fire informed us in October that it is currently looking for a new actuary, yet was unable to give us any more details in regard to their revised FSRP. We reached out to the plan last week regarding the FSRP prog progress, but have been unable to get in contact with them. Our next step will be reaching out to the city of University Park if no contact is made with the plan in the coming weeks. The only addition to this first table since October was Irving Fire. Its latest valuation has caused them to be subject to a revised FSRP due to assumption changes that increase their amortization period to infinite. The following table systems at risk of an FSRP also includes an additional system from the last FSRP report. Plainview Fire submitted a valuation that produced a 44.8 year AM period. Because the system performs valuations every other year, uh, if the next AV shows an AM period greater than 40 years, it will be required to formulate an FSRP. On the next page, we have the progress report on previously submitted FSRPs. Shown here is the list of, list of plans working towards the 40 year AM period requirement. While there is one plan on this page with an AM period below 40 years, Greenville Fire has a revised FSRP showing analysis of plan changes that produce an AM period of less than 40 years, but it has yet to submit a valuation since the FSRP showing that reduction. On the second section of this table are the two FSRP plans that submitted an AV with an AM period of less than 40 years since the last board meeting. Uh, Galveston Employees Retirement Plan for Police and Galveston Fire Fighters Relief and Retirement Fund have completed their FSRP requirement. And that concludes the FSRP report, unless there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, on to uh, item 3D, the interim study on funding policies for fixed rate plans. And I would ask uh, staff Miller's Mariah Miller and Ashley Rendon uh, to please come forward and talk about this paper. Mm. 
Good morning, members. Um, I'm Ashley Rendon, Management Analyst, and this is Mariah Miller, a Research Specialist on my team. So behind tab 3D, you will find the draft interim study on funding policies for fixed rate plans. Uh, today we are going to give you a brief overview of the interim study, and then we can answer any questions you all may have. As a reminder, Part of the PRB mandate is to include recommendations of any legislation in relation to public retirement systems that the board finds advisable. Accordingly, staff was directed at the November 16, 2017 PRB meeting to begin researching and identifying the role that funding policies could play in helping plans meet their funding objectives. The board asked staff to focus on how systems with fixed rate contribution structures could benefit from adopting funding policies. Ultimately, the draft study culminates in a recommendation that all public pension plans adopt a funding policy that outlines a path to full funding of promised benefits. The goal should be to fully fund the plan over as brief a period as possible, as recommended per in our uh, pension funding guidelines. The funding period should be a finite or closed period, and the funding policy should be established in conjunction with the plan sponsor if possible. In Texas, Fixed rate plans make up nearly 75% of Texas public pension plans. As you're aware, contributions to fixed rate plans do not automatically adjust to address negative experience like um, actuary actuarially determined contributions. Our research compared funded ratios over the last 15 years for systems with actuarially determined contributions and systems with fixed rate contributions. And a chart of the results can be found on page six of our report. We found two main things from this analysis. First, the, the average funded ratio of systems with actuarially determined contributions was higher overall than that of fixed rate systems. And second, the average funded ratio of systems with actuarially determined contributions has reversed its decline after the 2008 financial crisis, while fixed rate systems average funded ratio has continued a downward trajectory. We also researched funding policies themselves Texas plans as well as other systems around the nation and evaluated the benefits of adopting those policies. And Mariah will go into a little bit more detail on this and take you through the rest of our findings. Good morning members, Mariah Miller. In researching funding policies, we found that the South Dakota retirement system, one of the best funded plans in the nation, has had a robust funding policy for several years. Additionally, several Texas plans have already adopted funding policies, such as the City of Austin Employee Retirement System, and some plans such as El Paso Firemen and Policemen's Pension Fund currently have elements of a funding policy in their statute, and they are working on currently developing a standalone policy as well. Last session, the changes made to the three Houston plans, the Houston Firefighters Relief and Retirement Fund, Houston Municipal Employees Pension System, and Houston Police and Officers Pension System, effectively implemented a funding policy by creating a contribution corridor. The bill established a statutory funding policy that set a target contribution rate for the city based on the ADC and developed a corridor around the city's target contribution rate. The establishment of a funding policy has already helped Houston improve their credit rating. This paper identifies several or essential opponents um, that a sound funding policy should include, namely an established funding objective for the plan, which could be a funded ratio or an amortization period goal, the actuarial methods used to assess the plan, outlining how the plan will achieve their objectives and creating an ex-ante policy for when reality does not line up with actuarial expectations. Such an approach allows for stakeholders to know in advance how unexpected costs will be distributed between the employer and the employees. In closing, the benefits offered by the funding policies include increased transparency, good governance, funding discipline, and downside protection. Additionally, solid funding policies can help reassure credit raging agencies that pension debt is being proactively managed. Today we are seeking the board's approval of the study and the recommendations contained within it. We are happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> if uh, members have not read this uh, paper, I would encourage you to study. I would encourage you to do so. This is, uh, I think you'll find this enlightening. Um, I will tell you that it perhaps has been the biggest surprise to me uh, of anything I've learned since serving on this board to learn that most public pension plans in the state of Texas do not have a funding policy. Uh, it, uh, I'm just really surprised at that. I don't really see how you can effectively operate a pension plan without a funding policy, yet many are. Uh, and so uh, this uh, study contains exactly one recommendation um, that uh, um, public pension plans establish a uh, funding policy with uh, particular attributes as, as described in the recommendation and the uh, uh, Pension Review Board's funding guidelines. Um, and I want to commend the staff for their work on the paper. I think it's excellent. Uh, it gets outside of the state of Texas. It looks at uh, some examples uh, beyond the borders of the state. Um, and uh, I would, uh, pending any other questions, I would uh, like to make a motion that the board approve the uh, recommendation as presented in the study. Thank you. I uh, think you guys did a great job on this paper. Uh, I like it a lot. I think this is a really important topic. I uh, uh, fully agree with, with Vice Chair uh, Brainerd on that. This is um, something that uh, has been a long time coming. Um, we've seen a lot of the, um, the plans and cities that have come before us, the actuarial committee. There's lots of disagreement around what the objectives are uh, for funding uh, and who bears the cost. Um, and those fights can get pretty nasty and they're um, they're uh, very difficult to resolve once you are distributing kind of the pain after the fact. Moving to shared objectives beforehand, uh, a shared set of steps that would occur if there's negative experience is a huge improvement uh, and will improve not only the, the funding of pension plans, but should improve the ability of cities and plans to work together to resolve issues should they arise. Uh, so this is a great paper. I fully agree with the recommendation. Uh, I hope that this board will continue to uh, do work on funding policy. I think we've taken two big steps uh, in this interim by updating our pension funding guidelines uh, and then following up with this interim study. I think there's still a lot more to be done to really lay out uh, some uh, additional boundaries and ideas for what we can do on pension funding. So I hope we continue to pursue this, but nice work. I too would like to commend the staff on this. I think the, the paper, um, as, as the chairman has said, is a, a first step. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's the idea that there's no one policy that will fit everybody's needs. And there's a lot of flexibility in here. But, but again, it's a framework to start working on. And I think the staff could do a lot to work with plans in particular to develop the specific uh, policies that would work best for each of the, the plans. Um, in my reading of this final report, I did see one thing that I would like to ask uh, a wording, uh, a phrase to be added. And uh, again, this is a very small thing. But on page five, when you are describing um, non-actuarially determined contributions for other plans, and this refers to the um, to the uh, firefighter plans that are contributing um, at the same rate as the TMRS rate. I would like to uh, suggest that we add a phrase to the last sentence in that paragraph. So it, it's the, the sentence would read, such an approach can be problematic because the contribution rate for the municipal plans, while actually actuarially determined for that plan, has no bearing on the cost of the firefighter plan in cases where there is a different benefit structure, and I would add, and a separate pool of assets. Okay, thank you. All right. Can you please clarify which paragraph you're amending? Um, on page five, at the top of the page, it says non actuarially determined contributions. Two, paragraphs down it talks about other plans and that is the paragraph that I would amend and it's the last sentence of that paragraph. Can you uh, restate the language you're proposing meaning that you are doing the language? Uh, and a separate pool of assets. Thank you. 
So, Mr. Chairman, a procedural matter here. Are we voting on the entire report, or are we voting on the recommendation? Or My understanding is the motion we've got in front of us is going to be to adopt the interim studies legislative recommendation, uh, incorporating any technical changes that the board may have. Uh, so I believe that once we adopt the recommendation, the uh, staff can make any minor adjustments to language uh, and then publish that interim study. Thank you. So I've made a motion for the recommendation, and uh, I support uh, um, the proposed amendment to the text of the study. So moved. Second. All right, the motion has been moved and seconded to adopt the interim study's legislative recommendation incorporating any technical changes discussed by the board. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, the motion is to adopt the interim study's legislative recommendation incorporating any technical changes uh, by the board. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. The recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. And finally on this item, Mr. Chairman, is tab 3E update from Anu on the uh, online pension dashboard. Good morning, members. Uh, behind tab 3E, we have included screenshots of the dashboard that we have uh, in, in the uh, testing phase right now. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, the legislature uh, last session appropriated uh, funds for the pension review board. We have completed the task, and I'm very happy to report that, and we are very proud of the, the structure that we came up with. Um, the idea here is, uh, as, as a next step, um, for staff to provide the, or uh, uh, make a soft launch or provide the test site link to our retirement systems like we always do, um, so the systems can have a stab at the data that's included uh, on the dashboard. Uh, and at this time, members, of course, I would also encourage uh, if, if you all have any suggestions to um, improve the dashboard, we will uh, be happy to take any input. And we do have a phase two planned for the dashboard uh, in which we are planning to add additional interactive features, um, include a link for raw data, a, a, a standardized link for raw data, so um, data wonks can pipe our data through um, the system, as well as add uh, PDFs, plan reports to the dashboard, um, and some uh, additional features, uh, comparative features that, that we, had, uh, we have planned for. Um, what we have included in the packet for you, uh, if, if you uh, to give you a general idea or a sense of what the dashboard is going to look like, and the link is going to be available on our website, um, we will have a section for individual plan data. And folks would be able to, uh, there'd be a drop-down menu um, for folks to be able to choose the system they want to look at. And, and uh, after they choose a plan, uh, it will pull up the page. For example, we have included Abilene Fire uh, 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 system screenshots in here. Um, governance, benefits, actuarial, financial, uh, demographics, um, information that you want to find out about a system will be available um, on that page. And the way we have designed it is based on the data that we typically include in our guide to public retirement systems, as well as the various actuarial and financial uh, indicators of fiscal health that the, the board uh, talks about uh, for our retirement system. So we have organized the page based on those uh, criteria, as well as uh, the page 
contains data over time for every system. Uh, we will also have a, comparative, a section for comparative data uh, in which, again, based on some of the same indicators, uh, we, were, we have included um, comparative information for plants uh, grouped by asset size or plant type. Uh, statewide systems, for example, are grouped together, municipal plans are grouped together, and folks would be able to choose which fiscal year they want to look at. It, this particular page uh, is not going to show data over time, however, it's going to show uh, data for fiscal year uh, comparing systems uh, across uh, the same uh, similar asset size or plan type. Uh, so we wanted to make sure um, that members have had a chance to look at uh, how the dashboard has developed so far and also let the systems know, give them a heads up that they should expect um, uh, we will be reaching out to them, communication from us, uh, requesting their input uh, on the information that's contained uh, for their plan on the dashboard. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Members. Questions for Anu on this project? Josh. Um, so this is great. I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, my understanding is that this is um, going to be essentially a replacement for our guide for retirement systems that we uh, used to um, produce every two years. This will be more continuously available uh, and allow users to not only get to the data uh, at a higher frequency, but also be able to sort the data and visualize it uh, in a bunch of different ways. That's great. Can you walk us through specifically, so we're doing a soft launch, giving the link to plans, um, and then get input, uh, and then have a, a hard launch sometime. Can you walk through exactly when we plan those dates? Sure. So what our goal right now is to get the <coughs> test link, excuse me, out to the system sometime next week, um, and give our plans approximately one to two weeks uh, to provide their feedback. Um, and then take those changes back to our database uh, developer uh, as well as we'd have to scrub or uh, if there are any issues that the plants notice, uh, we'd have, have to make changes because this dashboard is linked to our internal database. Um, and once we uh, incorporate those changes and any input from the members, of course, uh, our, our target is to get uh, the, the dashboard uh, published by uh, second week of February at the latest. That's great. Now, just uh, so we're doing the soft launch, the, it's linked to uh, the PRB's internal database. Uh, so there shouldn't be, this is based on data that we use routinely and, and publicly report routinely. So there shouldn't be any issues with that. I just want to make sure that people have a chance to, to glance at it. <clears throat> That's correct. It's the same process that we follow with our guide to public retirement systems. Before we publish that report, we uh, ask our systems to review the information that we are reporting on them. And you're exactly right, Mr. Chairman. This is information information that we uh, receive from our systems. Thank you. Other questions for our new? Uh, Mr. Brainer? Please. Um, I, I would like to point out, In I assume this is current data and, again, hasn't been totally checked by the systems yet, but I would like to point out the page on asset allocation with the two pie charts. And, and this will have to do with perhaps my recommendation for further analysis. But um, I was particularly startled by the change in asset allocation overall from 2007 to 2017 with particular emphasis on the percentage of assets for all Texas plans being held in alternative uh, asset classes. And so down the when we proceed down the road, expect that I will be uh, asking for some investigation as to asset allocation uh, with with a special focus on uh, the asset classes. Thank you. Josh? Can I just add, add to that? I think that is uh, for the PRB, for uh, pension boards, for the legislature, scrutiny of assets, asset allocation, returns, fees, um, a real discussion of risk. I think that's kind of the, the next frontier. Uh, where um, uh, where we need to put some effort to make sure that there's alignment on risk, that uh, the allocations are appropriate, um, that uh, we're fee paying fees that are appropriate, 
Uh, so I, I completely agree with that. And I think that showed up in the Senate report as well. Other comments or questions on the uh, pension data center that uh, the staff has worked on? Well, this is the fulfillment of a lot of work and a lot of vision and a lot of planning for a long time by uh, the, especially the staff, and uh, really appreciate all the work they put into it. Uh, it's only going to get better from here, and I would encourage the members to take time to review these uh, uh, different sample pages and charts and uh, get back with Anu and her staff on uh, suggested changes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. And on a more lighter note, uh, we put in close to three months uh, of staff time every other year to uh, put the guide to public retirement systems together. Uh, with this dashboard, the hope is come next session, we wouldn't have to uh, spend as much time on that publication and instead um, the, the dashboard is going to house that, that data for, for the lawmakers as well as uh, our retirement systems and the, the, the general yeah, public. That's the way right. So just to clarify what you're saying is this uh, state agency is operating more efficiently because of the dashboard? That is correct. Uh, Our time will be <laughs> Okay, Mr. Chairman, that is the end of the uh, actuarial committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brainerd. Uh, we're moving on to item number six uh, on our agenda, the Education and Research uh, Committee. Uh, I'll call on uh, Judge Cable to uh, run this part of our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call on Joey Evans to talk to us about our MET program. Or Michelle. <laughs> Good morning, members. Uh, yes, Joey could uh, unexpectedly not be with us here today. But I will be happy to give you the update on compliance for minimum educational training program, uh, meaning the reports that systems send regarding their trustees and administrators having taken required uh, PRB training. And in this current meeting versus the previous, we have six more, um, or we have six uh, non-compliant systems. All of those are the ones listed below that are non-compliant for over 60 days. You will uh, see some frequent flyers on there, but as usual, we're working with these systems to um, reach out and, and try to help them get their reports filed and, and make sure trustees are compliant. If there are no questions, I'll move you to tab. Uh, let me yes. interrupt, I apologize. When contacting them, what is their response usually as to why they're doing? Um, I would say that contacting them is half the battle. So getting in touch with uh, uh, plans are some that we just you know go for long periods without uh, hearing from. And then when we do, it's often that just, you know, the person working on uh, the report hasn't been able to compile it and get it to us uh, or some circumstances that could be extenuating, but generally um, one of those two things. Do y'all feel confident that they're going to respond? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? One question. Um, there are 99 plans and we're totaling to 88 here. What's the difference? That's a great question. Um, what is happening here, Anu? Who are we not including? So we do have uh, close to eight systems that are uh, that have re newly registered with the PRB. Um, so we, we are still working with them um, regarding the training requirement. Um, and, oh, I think it may have to do with SIST, uh, systems that have multiple plans, meaning, for example, employee retirement system ah, sends okay. us one report, uh, but has multiple plans under it. Right. And, and Texas Hospital Association. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And our next report, um, at the last board meeting, the board had asked us to uh, bring evaluative data from our, our online courses uh, to, to gauge the quality and, and responses. Um, we always we have a survey at the end of each course, and I, I, it bears mention that, of course, the response rate is only two, uh, roughly two percent. Uh, but from those we do hear from, uh, the overall satisfaction rate is eighty-four percent, which you know, we consider good. But of course, we'd like to to see higher, um, and we included some comments for, for you to see. That generally speaking, the, the comments reflected not. 
uh, I believe, the quality of the curriculum or, or education delivered, but rather uh, some technical issues with the program we're using that we are trying uh, to work with them. And, and if we can't, then uh, look, explore alternatives to, to deal with that issue of not being able to print certificates, which we understand is, is frustrating for folks who are taking the courses. Any questions? Judge. Um, Michelle. Can you tell us roughly how many participants are taking this course online as opposed to in board meetings or at uh, conferences and seminars? No, not off the top of my head. I'd have to get you that. But I, I can say that given we've had almost 2,000, uh, so 1,900 course completions over the two-year period roughly that these have been out, um, of course, there are people who take all seven courses or take, you know, several courses, so that's not unique um, um, uh, participants, but rather courses completed. But I think you, you can see uh, from that that a lot of, of trustees are taking ours. And I know, for example, one of the statewide systems um, was a an educational sponsor accredited by us and decided not to renew because their trustees are using our online courses. So we took that as a, as a great compliment. Happy to get you the numbers. The amount of, of classes being taken and the, the overwhelming lack of response, um, are those issues fairly easy to resolve that they mentioned on there? The, the things referred to in the comments. Um, I'll be honest, the certificate printing issue is, is a difficult one only because the software that we use, which is otherwise, I think, very good, um, does not work well with Google Chrome. So if you're not using Internet Explorer, and it may even be that Edge is a problem, I, I can't exactly remember, but Chrome for sure, um, it, it, it just it won't print. And so that's something, like I say, um, we are contacting the company, requesting, can they do anything about this? You know, they've got their issues on, 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 on that. but. Um, we do want to look at alternatives down the road if that continues to be a problem, but of course that could be a, a, an amount of work to get switched over from the program we're in to, to something else. Do you have any more questions for Michelle? Michelle, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? Fantastic. Uh, moving on to agenda item number seven. Uh, the contribution of benefit decision making for Texas Public Retirement Systems. Uh, Anna, will you take the floor for this one? Thank you. Members, behind tab five, uh, we have included a report on contribution and benefit deci decision making for uh, Texas Public Retirement Systems. Um, uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, Brainerd had requested to add this item to the agenda, and what this report is showing is essentially the diverse nature of uh, how employer employee contributions as well as benefit changes um, are made uh, across our uh, um, defined benefit plans uh, across the state. Um, the requirement, of course, varies by system, uh, except for <clears throat> the local firefighter plan, excuse me, who are uh, under the purview of an umbrella statute called the Texas Local Firefighters Retirement Act. Uh, the systems are uh, uh, the the systems that have their governing statute um, laid out in state law uh, have different uh, pieces of how those decision making uh, is done. And this report is also included in the Guide to Public Retirement Systems. Um, we made sure that uh, for that agenda item, we present this report to the board as well. Um, and one of the points to note here is uh, none of our systems, at least in this report, barring a, a few, which uh, we have not noted uh, for, for this uh, uh, discussion, do not have, uh, like Ms., uh, Mr. Brainerd had mentioned, do not have uh, any funding policy requirement laid out in their state law, um, as well as uh, some systems, of course, do ado adopt funding policies like uh, TMRS, TCD, and have some requirement laid out in state law as well for those. Um, majority of our systems uh, do not have that requirement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you and the board would indulge me, I wanted to share a few observations that I had about this. This is basically a, an outline of the public pension governance structure in the state of Texas. <clears throat> uh, and I found this uh, information to be really enlightening. Uh, and I want to share a few key takeaways that I got out of this. <clears throat> Uh, in no particular order. First, public pension governance goes well beyond the board. Depending on the plan, governance also includes the legislature, the governor, city council, plan participants, and even in some cases the plan actuary. Second, this structure is needlessly complicated. As a matter of principle, public policy should be as clear and comprehensive, comprehensible as possible, and Texas public pension policy is not clear and it's not comprehensible. Public policy that is confusing or needlessly complex diminishes transparency and provokes cynicism. Third, these governance arrangements lack consistency, which is another hallmark of sound public policy. What is required to establish funding arrangements or to alter benefits in one city or another entity may be completely different in another. And I think we saw that with Fort Worth this morning. <clears throat> I had not been aware of that. The only entity in the state, apparently, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, has a requirement that 50% of all active participants actually participate in the, uh, in the election. Fourth, perhaps the biggest shortcoming in this governance structure is that for most plans and plan sponsors, there's no mechanism to ensure that the full required contribution be paid. Paying the actuarially determined contribution is the single most important factor in funding a pension plan. Yet governance structures for most plans include no such requirement. And finally, this governance structure contains no requirement or mechanism to reconcile benefits and expenses. There's no requirement of guidance for how and when adjustments should be made when a mismatch arises between benefits and funding. And we've seen that on full display this morning in the discussions with Fort Worth and Galveston. It's not limited to them. For many plans and plan sponsors, benefit structures and financing arrangements can be completely separate. And in many cases, they are with no requirement that they come together. This is a recipe for a potential disaster, which I think, frankly, we're seeing in a, in a number of plans around the state. Uh, we discussed earlier the uh, interim study on fixed rate plans that described the problems with relying on a fixed rate contribution structure. As the study says, if the contribution rate is going to be fixed, benefits have to be adjustable. Something has to give. And it's far more orderly and fair to clarify those adjustments before they're needed rather than after. The importance of the study's recommendation that plans have a funding policy is even more abundantly clear in the context of these governance structures. No action is required on the part of the board with respect to this agenda item, but I thought it would be helpful for this board and, frankly, everyone in the Texas public pension community to have clarity about this governance structure. Thank you. That was great. I. Um I completely agree. Uh, I would put it even in more blunt terms. We've got 20 plus laws applying to individual pension plans all over the country with no consistency. Uh, pension law right now for the state of Texas and governance uh, uh, herein is kind of a convoluted ad hoc mess. Uh, and uh, we're seeing some of the consequences of that play out uh, in our meetings uh, where there's not agreement on contribution rates, where uh, there's no uh, understanding of what it actually takes to fund the plan, uh, and there's no uh, structure, system, process for aligning benefits with uh, with contributions going in, and that's incredibly problematic, and it leads to a lot of time and effort uh, and fighting that uh, is unnecessary. Um, I think that uh, adopting a funding policy is a great first step. I think there are some things the legislature uh, should consider doing as well uh, to clean up some of these inconsistencies uh, that are uh, very clear uh, in looking at uh, kind of the statute, statutory framework uh, across the state uh, on pensions. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brenner, for including this in the agenda. Uh, I think it's a, a great uh, contribution. Any other questions, comments? All right, seeing none, that concludes uh, item number seven. We'll move on to agenda item number eight, the legislative committee. Uh, Mr. Brainer, would you take the floor uh, for this agenda item? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, behind tab 6A is information for the legislative committee and item. Behind tab 6A, legislative committee information. I would ask Anu to walk us through that, please. 
um, members, what we have included in your packet are uh, the reports, interim reports that came out of the House Committee on Pensions as well as uh, Senate State Affairs Committee. Both of those uh, committees are charged with um, overseeing both statewide as well as local retirement systems uh, in Texas uh, from the legislature. Um, and just a quick note here uh, for the 86th legislature, the House Committee on Pensions uh, is now under the Pensions and Investments Financial Services Committee and uh, Representative uh, Jim Murphy is uh, going to chair that committee. Um, we have included the, the report uh, from the House Committee on Pensions uh, behind tab 6A. Uh, and I will quickly give you a few highlights uh, from that report. Um, the, the first that I want to talk about quickly here is uh, one of the recommendations that came out was uh, the required, uh, recommending, the committee recommended that the legislature consider um, uh, uh, bringing the FSRP requirement, which is uh, currently contained in Chapter 802, uh, in line with the Pension Review, Review Board's uh, funding guidelines, so move the threshold from 40 down to 30 years, uh, as well as the report discussed the work that the Pension Review Board has been doing, as well as the, the intensive reviews that the board has undertaken, um, has moved or uh, sent the right signals to the system and encouraged the legislature to provide more resources to the PRB to continue its work of analyzing um, and researching and assisting some of these systems that are facing uh, funding shortfalls. Um, under the, um, the uh, un, un, behind tab 6B, we have included the report from Senate uh, Committee on State Affairs. Um, and the upshot from that uh, interim report is that the committee recommended each public pension system in coordination with local and state governments should have a clear pension funding policy that lays out a plan to fully fund pension benefits within a reasonable time period. Uh, this recommendation clearly uh, supports uh, the, the board's uh, interim study uh, on uh, funding policies, um, and I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Members, um, if you don't have any questions, uh, moving forward, what we have included behind tab 6C is uh, the bill tracking report that staff puts together during session. Um, this particular report uh, tracks pension and pension related bills that are filed. Um, and we update this report initially once every week and it's available on our website. Um, but down the line, when things start moving quickly, we uh, update the, the report and post it to our website every uh, twice a week or three times a week. Um, and if you um, have questions, of course, we'd be happy to uh, any of the bills that we are tracking. Um, one of the mandates that uh, the, the board has is to provide impact statements um, during session and we monitored these bills and their movement very closely, uh, partly also because of that. Um, and uh, it appears so far there have been quite a few bills, 20 bills that have been filed so far. There may have been more uh, since we put this report together. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Anu. Yes. Mr. Chairman, do we uh, are, are we know if anybody's going to propose a bill requiring a funding policy? Uh, we have received uh, questions uh, from lawmakers as well as um, yesterday at our um, Senate finance hearing, uh, Senator Huffman did indicate that she was planning to file a bill uh, requiring retirement systems too. Yeah, it's my understanding that that bill is either close to being filed or has already been filed. Um, I mean, I think the most interesting uh, legislation that this board should just be aware of uh, moving through is going to be TRS and ERS funding. Um, uh, and I'd ask the, the staff to keep a really close eye on that. 
Uh, of course, that has big implications for the state budget. Um, HB uh, or SB 393, uh, also uh, filed by Senator Huffman, uh, has kind of a ramp up to uh, close to ADC for TRS. Uh, so that will be something to keep an eye on. There's also uh, on the last page here uh, for you, Marsha, uh, there's SB uh, 322, which is essentially increased oversight and reporting requirements around investments. Um, and so that would be something that would be great for, for you to really take a look at. Uh, I know that, that Senator Huffman is, is open to suggestions there. Um, there's also this piece of legislation that I understand is close to being filed or is already filed around uh, funding policies requiring all state plans to work with their plan sponsors to craft uh, funding policies. So I think that's going to be uh, a great piece of legislation. And then we'll be watching closely to see what happens with the two plans that were here uh, today. If, if Fort Worth needs to move forward with legislation, if the if it, uh, the member vote does not turn out favorably, and then of course Galveston uh, police plan. Mr. Chairman. Uh, on, or Mr. Chairman, you may know where I knew the SJ4 by uh, Representative Menendez proposing a constitutional amendment to increase the minimum amount the state may contribute to the ERS and TRS. Is that a uh, would that change eliminate the 10 percent as a percentage of payroll cap? Correct. Thank you. And just uh, for the record, there is currently a constitutional cap of 10 percent of state funds. Uh, that can be contributed to ERS and TRS. Uh, ERS is already essentially at that cap. The ADC for TRS is very, very close. It's above 9%. I believe it's 942 or something uh, in that range. Um, and so both of those plans are bumping up against that constitutional cap. Unclear what happens uh, if they do. There's a little bit of uncertainty around uh, who the constitutional cap actually restricts whether it's literally state funds or whether it's uh, state funds that flow through local agencies or uh, state agencies as well. Um, but yes, that would raise that cap. Any other questions uh, for Anu? Uh, how often will you be updating the board on uh, legislation? Um, I know you said, but I missed it. Sure. Um, so we will be um, updating the report and posting it um, on our website pretty frequently. However, um, during session when things start moving quickly and as we see important pension bills that are filed, um, I will start sending uh, summaries um, to the board uh, once every week, uh, just outlining the bills that have been filed so far as well as any actions that may have been taken or hearings that may have been scheduled on those bills. So when you send it out to the board members, what would you want us to do? If you have any questions, of course, uh, you can uh, ask me about those bills. Um, and essentially, the idea here is to make sure we uh, staff keeps the board apprised of the movement on any bills that are going to impact our retirement systems, as well as since staff uh, is also going to work on bill analysis or, or uh, impact statements, actuarial impact statements for those uh, pension bills, uh, we, we try our best to keep the board informed in case they get any questions or... or Great. Uh, any other questions on this agenda item? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item number nine. Uh, we'll review and discuss a report from the executive director on. Ah, uh, sorry, I skipped over uh, agenda item 8B, uh, the guide to public retirement systems. Uh, so, Anu, can you walk us through that really quickly? Uh, members behind tab 6D, we have uh, included an outline of the, uh, the publication for you. This is essentially the same. Uh, structure that we followed uh, last session. Um, the guide is in the finishing stages. Um, we will be getting it out to the systems again for their input and uh, we may try to line it, line it up with the dashboard test site that we send out so we don't uh, bother the systems with same type of request twice. Um, and we are hoping that we will publish this report sometime uh, by mid-February as well. Um, it's a huge report. It, it requires a lot of work, as I had mentioned. Uh, 
and uh, hopefully this is the last time we will be publishing it um, for for session. So. Fantastic. Any questions on the uh, guide? All right. Seeing none, now we'll move on to agenda item number nine. Uh, where the executive director will report on several items uh, around uh, our budget financing. And if uh, members behind tab seven, uh, we have included uh, an update on our 2019 operating budget. Um, and uh, um, update the board that. Um, we are very much uh, in line with the, the funds that have been appropriated to us on track with our spendings. Um, and if you have any questions, we would, I'd be happy to answer. Hearing none, members, moving on. Uh, I just wanted to quickly remind you uh, that the uh, personal financial statements for uh, 2018 uh, will be due in April, and you all should hear from the Ethics Commission regarding that filing uh, sometime uh, next month. Uh, and if you have any questions, since we have new board members, um, I'd be happy to walk you through or answer any questions regarding that uh, filing. And lastly, uh, members, um, I wanted to um, let you know that we do have uh, a new uh, staff member that we hired uh, a couple of months ago. Um, Benjamin Warden is the newest uh, member, uh, staff member, and he's doing great. He has a degree in political science from Stephen Austin and has uh, quite a bit of uh, experience in uh, deep quantitative research, so we are very excited uh, to have him on our staff. Um, that's all I had, and um, I'd be happy to, again, answer any questions. Are there any questions on these updates? Um, one question, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, made a budgetary request this session. When do we expect um, uh, that to fully play out? That, um, we have already... Um, kicked off the process. We had a hearing yesterday. Um, and going back to, of course, agenda item eight uh, with the uh, uh, updates regarding the 86th uh, legislature uh, during session, that's um, uh, part of what we do with our um, legislative appropriations request. We had a Senate finance hearing um, yesterday, and the process will be that, uh, of course, we'll have another hearing on the House side regarding our budget. Um, and uh, sometime in April, we will find out more where we stand with our request. But yesterday, we had received some very positive feedback uh, from the senators um, uh, support, supporting our um, budget requests. So, Fantastic. Any other questions on this uh, agenda item? Uh, seeing none, we're going to move on to agenda item number 10, the annual committee assignments here. Uh, we've got two open slots, one on the legislative committee and one on the education and research committee. Uh, these are going to be the only two changes we're going to make uh, to committees for this year. Everything else should stay the same. Uh, on the legislative committee, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, make Stephanie Leiby the chair of that committee. Um, and then on the Education and Research Committee uh, for uh, Rosie Farina Strauss to join that uh, committee. Um, and like I said, those are the only two uh, committee changes we're going to make uh, at this time. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, we're going to uh, move on to uh, agenda item 11. But before we do, so we're going to go into closed session for uh, some training here that's going to take about 20 minutes. So I'm, I'd like to do public comments before we go into closed session so folks aren't sitting around waiting to make public comments. Uh, once we come back from closed session, we're just going to adjourn. You're welcome to stick around and watch us uh, adjourn in, in about 20 minutes. But let's do public comments now. Uh, so I'm going to move that agenda item uh, up. Uh, so if there's anybody who'd like to make uh, a public comment, please identify yourself, come up uh, to the podium, uh, and uh, 
Make your comment. Seeing none, this might be the first time uh, that I've been at a board meeting that we haven't had public comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to name names or call anybody out, but I know I couldn't let it go. Sorry. I, just for clarification, uh, for your your benefit. Sorry, my name is Tyler Grossman. I'm the executive director for the El Paso Fire and Police Pension Fund. We have the fifty percent plus one uh, rule, and we've changed our plan document no less than five times since 1980, uh, two times in the last four years. It just uh, takes education, 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 and then it takes education uh, by a person that the members trust, and you can get it done. With over 2,000 active employees, we had 90% vote with 80% voting yes. So it can be done. It just takes uh, a person or people that the members trust and, and a lot, and we did 40 meetings just with the fire department hitting all the stations. So, you know, you just have to talk, 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 talk. So, just for your information. Thank you. Is that requirement, Tyler, uh, in state statute or is that a city code? It is in state, state statute. Thank you. It's in our state statute. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, uh, we're going to go into public. Um, right. ah, we're going to talk about the date. Uh, so let's start with um, call for future uh, PRB agenda items. Does anybody on the board have anything that they would like to explicitly add to our, our future board agenda? Uh, Chairman. As I mentioned before, I would like to see that the PRB do some work on uh, asset allocation with, with an emphasis maybe on the medium and smaller size plans, um, looking at passive and active management, and a special focus on investment in alternatives. Got it. So noted. Any other agenda items that uh, board members would like to add? Seeing none, uh, the date and location of the next PRB board, uh, board meeting, the next meeting will be June 25th. Uh, it, um, at that point, we'll likely be back in our normal location, but that's still TBD. Uh, time uh, is likely to be the same, but that's also TBD. Uh, all right, so I believe that concludes uh, all of our business before we go into closed session. Um, so we're gonna move into closed session now. All right, it is 12.34 p.m. on January 24, 2019. The board is now in open session. No action was taken in closed session. The last agenda item we have, uh, if there are no further comments or objections, uh, is for the chair to move to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>